Good morning, everyone, and thanks for coming to this conference, and happy Mother's Day again. <laughs> so hopefully I'll be helping you, um, helping you be sun safe after this talk today. The timing of this talk is perfect, actually, because May is actually um, National uh, Skin Cancer Awareness Month, so hopefully you do learn a lot from this lecture. And just a few quick statistics, um, with a raise of hands, um, how many skin cancers do you think are being treated in the U.S. each year? Over 500,000, over 1 million, over 3 million, or over 5 million? So A, B, which is over 1 million, over 3 million, over 5 million. So it's over 5 million. Um, so more people are actually diagnosed with skin cancer than breast, lung, prostate, and colon cancer combined. And today about one in five Americans will develop skin cancer at some point in their lifetime. With the raise of hands again, what do you think is the rate of death from melanoma in the U.S.? Is it A, one person every week, B, one person every day, C, two people every day, or D, one person every hour? So shockingly, it is one person every hour, especially since melanoma can be preventable. So over the past three decades, the incidence of skin cancer has increased dramatically, and more people have had skin cancer than actually all other cancers combined. As I mentioned previously, about one in five Americans will develop skin cancer in their lifetime. And with regards to melanoma, which is the potentially deadly form of skin cancer, about 1 in 50 Americans will develop melanoma at some point in their life. This incidence has increased since about 10 to 20 years ago, in which only about 1 in 70 Americans were developing melanoma at that time. Melanoma is the most common form of skin cancer in young adults, age 25 to 29 years old. And if you've had more than five sunburns, your risk of melanoma doubles. And just by show of hands, uh, don't be embarrassed, but have anyone uh, used tanning beds here or known somebody who's used tanning beds? Raise your hands. So in the recent years, there's been a huge interest in research uh, looking at the dangers of tanning bed use. And research has shown that even with one time of tanning bed use, that it does increase your ris risk of skin cancer. Um, and it increases your risk of melanoma by 75%. And it increases your risk of squamous cell carcinoma, which is the second most common type of skin cancer, by 2.5 times, and increases your risk of basal cell cancer by 1.5 times. And this is just with one use. Now, UV radiation um, from the sun is what contributes to skin cancer. And UV radiation comes in three different forms. It comes as UVA, UVB, and UVC. Most of the UVC is filtered out um, from the Earth's atmosphere so that it doesn't actually reach the Earth's surface. So most of the UV radiation that reaches the Earth's surface is in the form of UVA and UVB, as you see here. Now, it was previously thought that it was mostly UVB that contributed to skin cancer, but we know now that it's actually both UVB and UVA that contributes to skin cancer. And this is important because when you look at sunscreens and the sun protection factor, or SPF, a lot of people don't realize that the SPF um, number actually only indicates your protection from UVB rays. So it does not indicate any protection from UVA rays. So effective December 2012, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, had established a standardized test for over-the-counter sunscreen products that establishes whether or not a sunscreen product can be, can be labeled as broad spectrum, which means they protect you from both UVB and UVA. So if you do have a sunscreen that is labeled as both broad spectrum and has an SPF of 15 or higher, you will be protected against sunburn and as well as that sunscreen will re reduce your risk of skin cancer and early skin aging. So if you have a sunscreen that does not say broad spectrum, or if the sunscreen has an SPF number less than 15, then it would only protect you against sunburn, but it will not protect you against skin cancer. So more about SPF, what does this number mean? 
So this number is a theoretical amount of time you can stay in the sun without getting sunburned. So if you have an SPF 15 sunscreen, this allows you to stay in the sun 15 times longer than you could without protection. So for example, if your skin starts to redden or burn in about 10 minutes without sunscreen, then theoretically, an SPF 15 allows you to stay in the sun for about 150 minutes before it reddens, before you get a sunburn. But this is not really so straightforward. And I use the word theoretically because um, realistically, you don't always get that amount of protection. And this is because sunscreen may be easily washed off with water or when you sweat. You may not have applied the sunscreen very evenly. You may not have reapplied the sunscreen often enough. Or if you are on certain medications that make you more sensitive to the sun, this can increase your risk of being more sun sensitive, including certain antibiotics, topical retinoids, and other products. So a lot of times people ask me, you know, what does the SPF really mean? Again, so we used to recommend many years ago, dermatologists, that you have an SPF of 15 or higher. But we now recommend at least an SPF 30 or higher. And this is why. So with this diagram, if you don't have any SPF or sunscreen, you see all the photons or the UV radiation enters the skin. If you have an SPF of 15 sunscreen, then about 93% of the UV rays um, are, are filtered or blocked, and so only about 7% of that enters your skin. And then if you have an SPF of 30 sunscreen, you get about a 97% protection. So that's why we recommend as dermatologists now to have at least an SPF 30 or higher. And another question I get asked a lot is, well, does an SPF 50 or 100 really make, give you that much more protection? So if you look at this graph here, this is the amount of protection you get, and this is the SPF number. So as I mentioned before, an SPF 30 blocks about 97% of the UV rays. So as you get to uh, SPF of 50, it blocks about close to 99% of the UV rays. And anything above that, it just really approaches 99%. Now there's two types of sunscreens. There's a physical and a chemical, chemical sunscreen. So the difference is that the physical sunscreen, as you can see on your left, acts by reflecting the light. So it physically blocks the UV radiation from your skin. And then chemical sunscreens, what happens is that it absor absorbs the UV radiation and converts it to heat and it's released and that's how it um, chemically blocks your skin from UV radiation. So there's different types of physical and chemical uh, sunscreens. So we all remember the, the, the physical blockers as the ones that were really white and pasty. Um, those are the zinc oxide and titanium dioxide ones. Well, um, it's great because they make it micronized now so that they're pretty clear. So you don't have to look like this gentleman here. <laughs> so the physical sunscreens are the zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. And these actually physically block both UVA and UVB. So if you do have a sunscreen product that has one of these ingredients, then you know that it's a broad spectrum uh, sunscreen. And then with the chemical sunscreens, again, they absorb the UV rays and convert them to heat, um, but they don't, do not necessarily block both UVB and UVA. So you have to look for these ingredients here. Um, avobenzone, it blocks both UVA and UVB. Mixoral, which is in the La Roche-Posay um, Antelios brand, blocks both UVA and UVB, and the helioplex in Neutrogena also blocks both UVA and UVB. But the great thing is, you know, based on the U U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, since uh, several years ago, all you really have to look on for the bottle is broad spectrum. Then you know that you're, you have a sunscreen that blocks both UVA and UVB. So these are the recommendations for sunscreen use. So again, we recommend an SPF 30 or greater, broad spectrum, and um, water resistant is better, especially if you're gonna be doing any exercise or um, potentially sweating in hot weather, uh, or doing any swimming or water uh, sports, you want to really apply a liberal amount. <clears throat> so the guideline here, if you look at this picture, this glass, you really want one ounce, which is enough to fill a shot glass. And this is the amount you want to use to expose uh, parts of your body. And of course, you want to adjust the amount uh, depending on your body size. So if you're not quite sure how much to put on, I usually tell people to put on a liberal amount, but at least put, on, put it on twice, so just two coats of the sunscreen. 
Um, you want to apply a good 15 minutes uh, before going outdoors, and you really want to reapply every two hours. And it doesn't matter if you have an SPF 30 or an SPF 50 or SPF 100. We really do recommend you re uh, reapply every two hours because there's other reasons as to why that, that sunscreen may be wiped off. For example, sweating or you're touching your skin, it's getting wiped off. Um, and of course, you want to reapply after sweating, um, swimming, or drying off. Um, even if you have a water-resistant sunscreen, it's really, really important to reapply again. So other sun protection measures include wearing protective clothing. Um, so we recommend fabrics that are tightly woven and darker colored fabrics. They do block out the UV radiation better. Um, a hat with a wide brim. And the reason why I kind of put up one of these pictures is that in the beginning when um, um, they were making a lot of these wide brim hats for more sun protection. A lot of times they weren't as fashionable, but they do make very fashionable, um, pretty looking ones now, so it's, it's very easy to find them. Um, you wanna wear sunglasses with UV protection because we are getting a lot more uh, skin cancers on the lower eyelids here, so you wanna make sure that you do protect your eyes when you're out. You wanna wear long sleeves and long pants or a skirt. And of course, seek shade. Um, the UV rays and the sun's rays are strongest between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. So if you wanna go out and exercise or walk, it's best to do it before 10 a.m. or after 4 p.m. And now there's a whole um, surge of clothing um, with UPF protected clothing or ultraviolet protection factor. And you can see these everywhere now in a lot of um, sports or athletic stores and Costco. Um, and UPF indicates how much of the sun's UV radiation is absorbed by the fabric. So for example, if you see a clothing that has a UPF 50, this means that only 1 50th or 2% of the sun's UV rays passes through the fabric to reach your skin. So I oftentimes recommend at least a UPF 50 or UPF 50 plus in clothing. Um, but it's important to remember that if you do have this UPF clothing, it does lose effectiveness in certain situations. And this includes if, you're, if it's pulled too tight, so the fabric is stretched out, um, more of the UV radiation can get through. If it becomes damp or wet, or if you do wash it um, or if you, and wear it repeatedly, then a lot of times it uses this UPF factor. So just quickly in my breakout session, I'm gonna just very, very, very briefly go over the science be behind some cosmeceutical ingredients, uh, mostly, um, uh, mostly talking about topical vitamins and vitamins in the diet as well, um, so that we have time for questions for everything. So thank you very much. Thank you.